This video is an introduction to the presidency. In this slide, you have the constitutional basis of presidential power, especially the enumerated powers, which are expressed and enumerated in the Constitution, as well as implied powers, which might derive from the enumerated powers, but which are nonetheless not enumerated. So among the enumerated powers, you have the power to execute the law. The Constitution bestows on the president executive power and authority over government. Uh, what this essentially means is that the laws that are passed by Congress must be executed by the president, and the president gets to decide uh, within the bounds of the law how to execute the different laws uh, that Congress passes. The power of military authority in Article 2, Section 2 um, gives the president or makes the president uh, the commander-in-chief of the nation's military. Article 2, Section 2 also gives the president the, pow the power to pardon or commute sentences, grant reprieves, that is to say reduce the sentences of people who have been uh, convicted. Uh, historically, uh, this was uh, important both for reasons of state, uh, people for instance who would engage in civil disobedience, or people perhaps who um, international relations would go better if we pardoned. Uh, the power of diplomacy. Uh, is in Article 2, Section 2 and Article 2, Section 3. Uh, the president is given authority to deal with uh, a nation's foreign relations. Uh, the constitutional, of course, enables the president to meet with foreign ambassadors and to negotiate treaties with them, although remember that the power to approve those treaties uh, rests uh, with the Senate. Now, from the power of military authority is often thought that the con that the power that the president has a limited power to, to wage war. Uh, the Constitution gives Congress explicitly the power to declare war in another country. Um, however, it's true that uh, the exigencies of war, uh, the fact that war can be declared very quickly or that crises can develop very quickly, have shifted uh, the war making powers uh, more towards the president who is. Uh, it is thought capable of more decisive and rapid action than Congress, which needs to convene, meet, debate, and of course eventually make a decision, by which time wars in the modern age may well be won or lost. And so uh, the power to wage war has shifted more towards uh, the president as time's gone by. Uh, but of course the, the power to wage war is not infinite. The, the president can't just uh, have troops um, go all over the world uh, without eventually seeking uh, congressional approval. Power over domestic security. Does the president have the unilateral authority to dispatch federal troops to assess them to address domestic threats? Um, this is something that uh, the president essentially seized during the Civil War. Uh, the power to call troops, of course, is um, explicitly given to Congress, but once again, the nature of domestic threats may be such uh, that uh, the president needs to respond quickly and decisively uh, when Congress uh, really cannot. And in cases of uh, secession, you might have whole parts of Congress, as in the Civil War, uh, that uh, is in fact in a state of insurrection. And so uh, the president, because he is elected by the entire country, uh, has often uh, taken the lead in addressing threats to domestic security, and none more so true today than in an age of terrorism. Other enumerated powers include the power to veto legislation. Uh, this is a very important one in the president's dealing with Congress and largely the source of the president's influence over domestic legislation. Uh, the Constitution gives the president the power to veto. Um, after Congress passes a bill, the president can veto it, which means prevent it from becoming law. Congress can overturn the veto uh, if Congress can get two-thirds majorities in both the House and the Senate, uh, and then the president's veto will be overturned and uh, the bill will become the law nonetheless. But because it's very hard to get two-thirds of Congress to agree on anything, uh, in practice the power to veto is quite a big block to congressional lawmaking. 
Uh, and what this means is that the Congress can, I'm sorry, the President can send signals to Congress and saying, I'm not going to sign that bill unless you include this, that, or the other provision. And Congress has to figure out whether it's worth fighting the President on this or whether ultimately they should cave in. And it's usually easier to cave in because, again, the prospect of overriding a veto uh, is difficult. On the other hand, Congress may strategically propose legislation to the President uh, that they know he will veto in order to make him look bad. So a piece of legislation that they feel the public wants, but that the president is going to veto. Congress may well present such legislation to uh, the president and, and dare him to veto it. If he does, he may end up jeopardizing his reelection chances uh, if the public is not happy with that. The power of appointment is also one of the more uh, important day-to-day -day powers of the president. The president can nominate and appoint with the Senate's advice and consent. Uh, various political officers, including especially the members of the Supreme Court. Members of the Supreme Court are appointed by the president, although they must be confirmed, that is to say approved, by a majority Senate vote. Now, uh, when it comes to his own cabinet and his own administration, uh, th there is no need for advice and consent of the Senate. That is to say, top-level bureaucrats uh, like the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of the Interior uh, do not need to be uh, approved by the Senate. Uh, these are the president's hand-picked men and women, so to speak, and these people um, are, again, very powerful figures and influence how legislation gets um, implemented, how vigorously it gets enforced, and so on and so forth. Now, from these uh, implicit, uh, sorry, fr from these enumerated powers, you have some implied powers as well. Uh, the power to issue executive agreements. Uh, this is a power that um, derives from the president's foreign policy making powers. Um, and basically, uh, presidents have from time to time signed agreements with uh, foreign countries and foreign dignitaries without waiting for Senate approval, and indeed without even asking for Senate approval. And of course, uh, while these treaties do not become the law of the land in the sense that uh, courts would consider them law, as long as uh, successive administrations and presidential administrations abide by these executive agreements, then they basically function as treaties. Uh, a lot of people feel like this is pretty controversial. Uh, executive privilege is another uh, power that is um, that many presidents claim is implied, again, in war-making powers especially. Uh, that is to say, because a lot of uh, military matters and domestic security matters are uh, sensitive, that is to say, if uh, that information were to get out, it would ge give aid and comfort to uh, the United States' enemies uh, from the United States' enemies either within or outside the country. Uh, presidents have claimed that uh, a substantial portion of their correspondence, uh, as well as their uh, general activities, uh, can legitimately and legally be uh, shielded from uh, scrutiny by others, uh, at, which includes Congress as well as the public. Okay, let's step back a minute. Now that we know what uh, the Constitution said about uh, the president's powers and what various presidents have um, interpreted that to mean, uh, let's step back for a minute and think about what a president is for. What vision did the framers of the Constitution have for the presidency? Well, um, they wanted several things out of uh, the president. And this uh, we know this because a uh, fairly uh, strong debate uh, about the role of the president uh, did in fact occur uh, around the Constitutional Convention and prior to the Constitutional Convention and after the Constitutional Convention when the Constitution was ratified people were arguing uh, for and against the particular vision of the presidency that had been outlined. Uh, let's say that the president that the framers had envisioned was uh, a fairly uh, I wouldn't say minor figure but um, not the most powerful uh, figure, particularly as pertained to domestic politics. Uh, they were particularly worried about creating a new line of kings, although some did advocate for kings. Uh, a lot of people were very uh, skeptical of centralized executive power, and they wanted to uh, not reproduce uh, the Britain's governing system, but instead try to improve upon it. Uh, what they did want was a unifier, uh, somebody who stood above the fray of politics, in that sense very much like a monarch, someone who wasn't a partisan figure, 
uh, but rather someone who, because he was elected by the entire population, uh, or by the entire country, not the entire population, of course, at the time, uh, because he was elected by the entire country, uh, among all the states, he would represent the entire country and therefore not factions. They also wanted the president to be uh, an accountable figure. That is to say, because the president was going to be the only one in charge of the day-to-day -day affairs of um, how to implement law, that this, this person um, be clearly accountable uh, for uh, what they did well and what they did poorly. Uh, in the same vein, they wanted the president to be a very competent administrator. They thought they thought that the president should be picked, selected among the best of the men, the most virtuous and the most competent uh, administrators out there. Because again, the president was going to have to manage the federal bureaucracy and was going to have to skillfully um, wage diplomacy with uh, other countries. And finally, um, again, on this diplomatic trend, foreign policy stability was particularly clear. Uh, one of the proposals was particularly desired. One of the goals, uh, or one of the proposals that was on the table uh, at the time the Constitution was uh, written uh, was a three-person executive. Uh, so to have three presidents, a kind of triumvirate like the Romans did. Uh, today, Switzerland has a seven-member executive, not one president, but seven people who uh, sit in a council. Uh, and so it was considered that three, maybe three, would be better than one. And one of the reasons why three, we didn't get three presidents, and we only got one, was the worry that because the presidency had to deal with foreign policy matters, that uh, the president had to speak with one voice. Uh, and uh, it couldn't be the case that one president said one thing and the other president said something slightly different, and this misled allies and enemies alike and creating foreign policy chaos. Uh, as a uh, relatively young nation, the United States was seeking to establish itself in the international state system. And to do that, it had to be taken seriously. And of course, if uh, it was sending mixed signals to all of uh, the other countries because of its three presidents were, weren't working together very effectively, uh, then that would undermine its status uh, and its prestige. Um, and this would um, be a problem for the United States, uh, make it more vulnerable. So again, these are sort of four major informal goals that the framers had in mind for the presidency. So then I have to ask you, did the framers get what they wanted out of the president? If you look at the president today, do we have, are these four goals met? I want to submit to you guys that pretty clearly the president we have today, or the presidency, right, not the particular person, but the, the office of the president, uh, that we have today is very different from the office of the president as it was conceived of by the framers. Uh, the president is no longer above the fray right, of partisan politics. The president has in fact become the leader of his party. And so in that sense, he's not as much of a unifier. He can't be because he's very much a partisan figure. Uh, moreover, uh, the president uh, has acquired much influence over lawmaking through exercise of vetoes uh, as well as through administrative orders. Uh, the president has become uh, much more influential over how the law is uh, eventually implemented and what laws in fact get made. Uh, that makes the lines of accountability much less clear. The framers thought, okay, the Congress will be uh, responsible for creating legislation, and the president will simply implement what Congress tells him to. Uh, but that's not at all what happens, of course. The, the president has a huge amount of influence over what legislation Congress passes uh, or doesn't pass. And so, uh, as a result, uh, it's not so clear whether the situation that we have, legislatively speaking, that the laws that we have are more uh, from the president or more from Congress. Also, uh, the Senate's power to ratify treaties means that the president's power to negotiate with foreign uh, dignitaries and ambassadors and leaders is somewhat blunted. Because anything the president can does and negotiates can be overridden by the Senate eventually. Uh, this is particularly prob problematic when the United States wants to enter um, international uh, agreements, uh, international treaties, inter um, things like the League of Nations. So Woodrow Wilson, uh, you know, signed uh, the founding of the League of Nations. Indeed, was was one of the main founders of the League of Nations. But Senate refused to ratify his 
signature on that treaty and the United States never joined the League of Nations in the 1920s. Uh, more recently, agreements on climate change negotiated by President Obama uh, were not ratified by a Republican Senate, and so uh, the United States did not join uh, the Kyoto Protocol and other main international agreements on limiting greenhouse gases. Uh, and of course, um, this, um, this power of the Senate to override what the President does in his foreign policy uh, actually uh, kind of gives a voice to some of the worst fears of um, of the framers about this lack of foreign policy clarity about what the United States' stance really is. But uh, we can still ask whether these evolutions are a bad thing. After all, it might be that these evolu this evolution is largely necessary um, and so that these additional powers um, that and disabilities that the president has contracted over time uh, are in fact uh, a good thing, and that's uh, I'll leave that for you to decide. Now, it's worth noting that in the United States system, the United States president is a very powerful figure when his party is in control of both houses of Congress, particularly if his party has 60 plus votes in the Senate. This is a fairly rare occurrence, but when it happens, the U.S. president pretty much gets to do whatever he wants. Uh, because the president is the leader of his party and because the president has such influence already over Congress, even when it's not in his own hands, uh, you might say that um, the president becomes, again, uh, you know, I wouldn't say a dictator necessarily, but has no real political obstacles uh, in his way um, on the legislative front. On the other hand, when the opposing party has made majorities in Congress, uh, the president is much less powerful and has to negotiate uh, with Congress. And these negotiations are, are, are difficult often and time consuming and, and often result in compromises uh, where neither side really um, feels particularly happy. We've seen a lot of that uh, in the past. Oof. Since at least since uh, the late 1990s, uh, Actually, I mean, other, a brief period of two years during the Obama administration, where Obama had con had Democratic control of both the House and the Senate, um, and prior to that, uh, it's hard to think of. Um, you have to go back to the 1970s uh, to see again Democratic majorities uh, like that. Okay, so the point is is that the president's power is rather variable. Uh, the power, president is a very powerful figure. Uh, when his party controls both houses, a weaker figure when he doesn't. Now, this is actually in stark contrast with parliamentary systems, the kinds of democratic systems that we see in Western Europe, uh, as well as Japan and other parts of the world, where there's a prime minister who is the chief executive, um, and the prime minister uh, also happens to be the leader of the dominant party in the legislature. So. That is to say that the, the prime minister is not usually independently elected. Uh, the prime minister instead just happens to be the speaker of the house, essentially, the equivalent of the speaker of the house. And so uh, in that sense, there is no schism between the legislative branch and the executive branch. There can't be. Whoever happens to be in control of the legislature also controls the executive branch. Uh, and so the prime minister, therefore, is always going to be a fairly powerful figure unless he's at the head of a coalition government. But generally speaking, the prime minister can make policy without having to bargain with Congress, with the legislature or parliament or whatever it happens to be called, a diet in Japan. So the executive and legislative branches are fused in that system, and the prime minister tends to be a more powerful figure. This is one of the reasons why... Uh, in the 1980s, you can contrast Margaret Thatcher, who was the conservative prime minister of Great Britain, and Ronald Reagan, who was the conservative president of the United States. Um, and Margaret Thatcher got a lot more conservative legislation done because Margaret Thatcher, uh, as leader of her party and leader of a majority in the P UK parliament, was able to do whatever she wanted, whereas uh, President Reagan had to deal with Democratic Congresses throughout most of his administration and so therefore was not able to implement his domestic legislative program the way that Margaret Thatcher was. Now, uh, 
I've sort of hinted at this, but the presidency has evolved over the years. The president, the powers of the president have changed substantially uh, since um, the founding of the United States. And part of this is forced by external events, uh, external events like particularly wars, World War One, World War Two. Uh, the Civil War, 9-11, the Great Depression, the Cold War, all of these um, crises uh, often forced a reassessment of the role of the president because uh, crises tend to require swift, decisive action, and in government, there's really only the president that's capable of doing that. Congress is just not able to organize itself quickly enough to respond to immediate threats. And so uh, a lot of this evolution is forced by external events, uh, but it's also the case that particular presidents chose to uh, lobby for more powers for themselves and chose to change the nature of the presidency. They didn't have to, but they did. So if you think about uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, Andrew Jackson was the first partisan president, the first president who was very clearly the leader of his party. So very early, right, Andrew Jackson was the seventh president, uh, the presidency loses its shall we say, above the fray character, and becomes uh, very much involved in a partisan politics. The president campaigns on behalf or helps uh, congressmen and senators uh, win seats by throwing his weight behind particular candidates. Uh, so again, uh, Jackson was very much an innovator in that sense. Uh, Lincoln cemented the president's powers over domestic security by uh, uh, claiming uh, powers during the Civil War, and in particular making a stand against uh, the uh, against the secession of the Confederacy, um, he essentially established a precedent that the president was going to deal with uh, threats to the domestic integrity of the United States, even from within. Uh, Wilson, uh, at the dawn of the 20th century, right, was the president um, through World War I, um, Wilson was uh, the man who started going public, and going public simply means uh, using the media to his own advantage. That is to say, being uh, particularly savvy and trying to uh, go past uh, Congress to address constituents directly, to address the nation directly. This was not something the presidents had really done very much of before. Woodrow Wilson. Of course, this was perfected by Franklin D. Roosevelt during the Great Depression and World War II when he had these fireside chats on the radio. Um, but Wilson really was the innovator there, where he again bypassed um, Congress and, and again addressed the people uh, very much directly. Franklin D. Roosevelt um, cemented the precedent that the, that the President of the United States was going to get involved in domestic economic policy and was going to take the lead in responding to domestic economic uh, urgencies. Uh, prior to that, uh, the President was just not conceived of as an economic policymaker. I mean, good things happened during, during presidencies and bad things happened during presidencies, and the Presidents had some control over the establishment of a national bank or um, had some control over, uh, again, tariffs, uh, things like that, but the president really wasn't considered responsible for the economic fate of the nation until FDR assumed that responsibility for the presidency. Economic policy making was, if anything, up to the states or, or Congress. And finally, um, after 9-11, we see uh, the president combine the war-making powers and the domestic security powers um, and uh, really take charge of domestic surveillance, surveillance right? Really take charge of um, an added, um, added responsibilities for um, monitoring the American population. And of course, uh, between the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, and Homeland Security, that monitoring of the U.S. population has indeed increased since 9-11. Okay, let's talk about the tools the president has at his disposal. We've already mentioned some. In addition to his veto threat, in addition to the fact that he's the leader of his party and so he can reward some people uh, through the party, uh, in addition to his power of appointments, another way he can reward supporters, uh, and in addition to his access to the media, uh, he can call a press conference any anytime, uh, other people can't, uh, the president has three formal tools in his toolbox uh, which he can wield to really um, influence policy in his administration. 
Uh, he has executive orders, he has executive agreements, and signing statements. Executive orders are the orders that the president issues to the executive branch, um, and they basically tell bureaucrats what to do. So sometimes these actually initiate new policies, uh, particularly if they don't contradict standing law, and particularly if the president can find a congressional resolution authorizing him to do these things, um, the president can issue executive orders even when Congress didn't really explicitly say he could do that. Um, now, since 1952, and 1952 is important because President Truman issued an executive order nationalizing U.S. steel mills in 1952, which the Supreme Court overturned. So since 1952, every executive order contains language citing where the authority to issue the order comes from. That way, there's no threat that the Supreme Court will veto it. Um, executive agreements are agreements with foreign powers that I should say one more thing about executive orders. Uh, executive orders um, have become a, a larger part and a larger feature of the presidency over the 20th century as the federal bureaucracy has grown. The federal bureaucracy has uh, grown leaps and bounds uh, since the founding of the American Republic. Uh, federal spending is now uh, somewhere around 45% of gross domestic product of all the income of the United States. Uh, as a result uh, of this, this trend. That means the bureaucracy is just much, much larger. And of course, uh, that means that the president is in charge of a much larger um, fraction of the economy uh, than, um, than he once was. So executive orders become all that much more important. Okay, executive agreements are agreements with foreign powers that avoid the Senate ratification process. We've already talked about this. They're sort of politically binding, but not legally binding. That is to say, the treaty does not, the executive agreement does not become a law of the land. Uh, it simply um, is a statement of policy on the part of the president uh, about what the United States is uh, going to do, uh, his United States' intentions. Um, but once again, it doesn't become actual law. Uh, a lot of constitutional experts are somewhat suspicious of executive agreements um, because of the fairly clear language that the Senate ought to be involved in, in negotiations. Still, as, we've, as I talked about earlier, the Senate can be inconvenient in such negotiations because they can really hamstring the president's power to make deals. Um, so once again, um, that's kind of a double-edged sword. Signing statements, the third tool. Uh, signing statements are statements the president makes at the time that he signs a law into law or signs a bill into law um, explaining how the president sees the law and interprets it. Now this is important because laws are not always written very precisely and as a result uh, the president may have some discretion about how to uh, implement this law, uh, how to enforce it. And so the president may put a signing statement says, being very clear that this is how he understands the law um, and so this is how he's going to enforce it. This is a message essentially to Congress as well as a message to the executive branch um, that says that if you wanted something else, you should have said it and you should pass a new law if you want something else. Okay, uh, let's finish up with some fun facts here. Uh, who do you think the top five presidents at issuing executive orders are? And we're going to measure this in number of executive orders per day in office, right? So it's a ratio. Obviously, a president like Franklin D. Roosevelt, who stayed in office for 12 plus years, uh, is going to issue more executive orders um, in total. But, you know, uh, but on a per diem basis, uh, who issues the most executive orders? Um, and of course, executive orders have become more and more controversial um, over time. Well, if you look, um, actually the, the heyday of executive orders was uh, from the 19-teens through the 19, early 1950s, right? So from Theodore Roosevelt to Harry Truman, roughly, you see uh, the president does a lot of executive ordering, so to speak. But since then, it's been fairly restrained. Um, in fact, the last few presidents whose executive orders have often been the most bitterly resented, George Bush and Barack Obama, uh, these presidents have issued uh, not that many. They issue 0.1 per day, so one every 10 days. Um, and 
compared to Franklin Roosevelt, who issued nearly one a day, um, we've come down a long way. Of course, perhaps the ones that are issued today are more important because the federal bureaucracy is generally larger. But again, uh, it's interesting to see that our perceptions are sometimes at odds with reality. Now, a word on executive orders, right? Wars have been fought under executive orders. So the intervention of the United States Army in Kosovo in 1999, for instance, was fought without a uh, congressional declaration of war. Uh, big policy changes have been mandated using executive orders. Uh, racial integration of the armed forces. Truman decided on his own that units would be no longer segregated. Uh, desegregation of public schools. Again, Eisenhower did this essentially on his own. Um, FDR decided to intern Japanese citizens on his own recognizance without congressional approval. These are all measures that the presidents felt like they needed to take and use executive orders to do. And these are fairly big changes, at least for, for the people concerned. Uh, of course, the Supreme Court can declare executive orders unconstitutional, just like he can declare legislation unconstitutional. He can say the president has overstepped his powers. So Truman's nationalizing of the steel mills, unconstitutional. Clinton's order that the federal government should not contract with organizations, particularly businesses that employ strike breakers, unconstitutional. Again, you don't have the power to do that, apparently. Now, of course, Congress can overturn executive orders if they're not happy with them. Congress can simply pass a bill that supersedes executive orders, and in so doing, of course, um, yeah, in so doing, uh, the executive order becomes null and void. All right, well, I hope that was uh, at least somewhat informative. Uh, as always, if you have questions, uh, you know how to reach me.